สวัสดีค่ะ Welcome to the ASEAN Challenge, the news updates around your ASEAN block, both in English and in Thai. I'm Alisa Sitiwong. ดิฉันทอสายรัศมีทีแท็กแก้วนะคะต้อนรับคุณผู้ชมเข้าสู่รายการ ASEAN Challenge ค่ะก็มีหลากหลายประเด็นหลายเรื่องราวมาฝากกันนะคะที่เกี่ยวข้องกับประชาคมเศรษฐกิจอาเซียนค่ะใช่แล้วค่ะ Beginning off with ASEAN around us going to Indonesia, specifically in Jakarta. Now they've come up with a way in order to save the environment as well as allow their customers to enjoy their ingredients or what we can say all of the product as mm -hmm. all. Now in Indonesia, specifically in Jakarta, they come up with glass that you can eat. Oh. So there is this one food and beverage seller in Jakarta, and what they do is they make ice creams. Now, not only can you eat the ice cream, but you can also eat the cup that the ice cream comes in as well. Uh -huh, it's a good ah, idea. It's a very yum good yum. idea as well. It's very eco-friendly as well. <laughs> Now, these cups are made from seaweed actually, and it tastes like jelly. So it's not going to taste like any. Foam or plastic or anything bad. It's actually pretty good tasting, and because Indonesia has a lot of seaweed, they produce tons and tons of seaweed per year. This actually makes it good for the economy in terms of Jakarta for the local sellers of seaweed as well. So this startup is called Evaware. And what they do is they make cups, as we can see on the screen at the moment now. So that cup there, as you can see, it's mm -hmm. made from what looks like jelly. You can eat that with the ice cream. Look at the model. Try <laughs> like All right. So for this one, Everwear, their founder said that they support the environment-friendly cause, and Everwear's what they call Ello Jello container is. Um, for them to serve ice cream, and they feel the consumers may take time to adapt to the product because it's slightly, of course, pricier than plastic cups or paper cups. But however, because it has an eco-friendly uh, motive to it, we believe that you know the consumers are willing to pay a little bit more in order to be able to save the environment. Now, another co-founder, David Christian, has said that the idea of seaweed-based edible packaging was spurred. By his desire to fight an explosion in plastic waste over the last few years in his home city of Jakarta, Indonesia currently has about 10 million people in it, and what they do is they produce about 10 million tons of seaweed each year. So he got this idea, and he decided we're going to make cups made from seaweed. So the edible seaweed, Ello Jello, that's what they call it, can be up to five times more expensive than the ordinary crepe cones, um, and uses wrappings of plastic and paper to preserve its texture. And they hope that in the future packaging will be better and not use plastics. And in the future, they also plan to expand into other types of packaging as well, such as dissolvable sachets for coffee or seasoning. นะคะก็เชื่อว่าจริงแล้วเนี่ยคุณผู้ชมหลายท่านที่ดูอยู่อาจจะบอกว่าถ้าเป็นคนที่มีใจรักสิ่งแวดล้อมนะคะก็อยากจะลองชิมอะไรที่มันดูแปลกๆออกไปเนี่ยอาจจะยอมจ่ายนะคะเพื่อที่จะซื้อนะคะแพ็กเกจจิ้งตัวนี้นะคะก็คือเป็นแก้วเครื่องดื่มนะคะหรือว่าเป็นตัวที่ใส่ไปในไอศครีมซึ่งรับประทานได้ด้วยนะคะทํามาจากสาหร่ายนะคะเป็นฝีมือความคิดนะคะแล้วก็เป็นสิ่งประดิษฐ์ของชาวอินโดนีเซียนั่นเองค่ะคือที่ประเทศอินโดนีเซียเนี่ยเขามีการผลิตสาหร่ายเนี่ยนะคะออกมาได้เยอะมากปีปีหนึ่งเนี่ยได้ตั้งเป็น10ล้านตันเลยทีเดียวนะคะก็เลยมีความคิดว่าจะมาพัฒนาเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์อะไรได้บ้างล่าสุดก็เป็นแนวคิดนี้เลยนะคะหลังจากที่ต้องมาเผชิญกับปัญหาพวกแก้วน้ำพลาสติกนะคะหรือว่าภาชนะพลาสติกเนี่ยถูกทิ้งไว้จำนวนมากนะคะผู้ก่อตั้งบริษัท e v o w a r e เนี่ยเขาก็เลยคิดว่าเอ๊จะทำยังไงดีที่จะช่วยแก้ปัญหานี้นะคะสุดท้ายแล้วก็เลยคิดว่างั้นเอาเจ้าสาหร่ายเนี่ยนะคะมาทำเป็นบรรจุภันมีลักษณะคล้ายๆกับเยลลี่แบบนี้นะคะพอทานไอศครีมหรือดื่มน้ําหมดแล้วเนี่ยก็ทานบรรจุภัณฑ์เข้าไปด้วยใช่นะคะก็จริงๆสาหร่ายเนี่ยถ้าจะคนเชิงลึกอาจจะมีเขาเรียกว่ามีประโยชน์หรือเปล่าอาจจะทำให้อิ่มท้องไม่อ้วนไม่รู้นะคะแต่ประเด็นก็คือเขาบอกว่าความปัญหาขยะพลาสติกล้นเมืองในอินโดนีเซียเนี่ยก่อให้เกิดปัญหาการปนเปื้อนตามแหล่งน้ําธรรมชาติค่ะแล้วก็เป็นนโยบายของรัฐบาลด้วยเพราะว่าอยากจะลดปริมาณขยะตามแหล่งน้ําลงให้ได้ 70% ์ภายในปี2025ปีคริสตศักราชนะคะส่วนสาหร่ายที่เอามาใช้นะคะก็ไม่ใช่ว่านึกจะทําเอามาใช้ก็มาใช้นะคะเขามีการเพาะเลี้ยงมาเป็นอย่างดีแก้วน้ํานี้ก็มีความสะอาดค่ะเพราะฉะนั้นผู้บริโภคเนี่ยสามารถที่จะรับประทานแก้วน้ําตัวนี้ได้เลยนะคะนี่จากภาพก็จะได้เห็นว่าประเทศเพื่อนบ้านของเรานี้นะคะก็มีอุตสาหกรรมการเพาะเลี้ยงนะคะอุตสาหกรรมการเกษตรเพาะเลี้ยงสาหร่ายจริงๆอย่างที่เห็นในภาพนี้เลยทีเดียวนะคะส่วน
ตอนนี้ผลิตทั้งแก้วน้ำไปแล้วผลิตโคดไอศครีมไปแล้วเดี๋ยวในอนาคตอาจจะมีแบบอื่นอีกแต่ก็ถือว่าเป็นบรรจุภัณฑ์รักโลกนะคะที่ประเทศข้างๆเนี่ยก้าวล้ำหน้าไปแล้วถูกต้องค่ะ so for of course the Indonesian government of course as you mentioned they want to reduce the amount of waste in water by 70% by the year 2025 so it takes small companies like this to help each other in order to meet this goal so hopefully Indonesia will be able to meet that goal in 2025 we'll keep you posted on more updates in terms of the environment and innovative items in Indonesia with that said let's take a short Break, okay. and we'll be back for some news updates coming soon. Welcome to the program. You're watching ASEAN Challenge, and on to ASEAN hot issues. We have several news updates around our ASEAN bloc, beginning off with Indonesia and specifically in Bali, as the volcano Mount Agung has erupted. Now, in terms of officials of the Indonesia's National Disaster Mitigation Indus Agency, excuse me, or PNBP, they have said that they are. Warning that there could be bigger eruptions to occur and happening where possible, based on information agency is receiving from the volcano monitoring center. At the moment, now of course they have told residents around the area to evacuate immediately since the eruption began. Um, but however, they believe that the explosion this time might not be as big as it was 50 years ago, according to their recent data. So at the moment, as we can see, this is the area in which the eruption is going to take effect. And residents were told to immediately evacuate the danger zones that circle Agung in a radius of eight to ten kilometers, so that's approximately five to six miles. But some were reluctant to go without their livestock, so that's some of the situation going on. Now, in terms of the airport, if you are planning to go to Bali at the moment, you might need to, of course, take a look at the news updates more carefully because the airport on the resort island of Bali was also closed since last month. Monday due to this volcanic ash and can cause significant damage to aircraft engines, leading to possible engine failure and compromising pilots' visibility. Other risks also include clogging of fuel and cooling systems. So this is a situation that's going on in Bali at the moment. They've come out with a warning for, let's say, a few months already in terms of Mount Agung and um, the possibility of, of eruptions. At first, they weren't so sure when it would erupt, so they did come out with a warning initially and they did try to evacuate people around an 8 to 10 kilometer radius of the mountain but however of course at that time because you know residents wanted to stay in their location they needed to make a living so therefore they didn't want to move they were reluctant to but now of course Mount Agung has erupted and so we have to be very careful in terms of possibilities that it might become a bigger eruption in the near future. นะคะเหตุการณ์แบบนี้เนี่ยแน่นอนว่าคงไม่ได้แบบสิ้นสุดนะคะเหตุการณ์ภูเขาไฟปะทุวันนี้พรุ่งนี้จะหยุดได้ก็เป็นไปไม่ได้นะคะเพราะฉะนั้นสิ่งที่ประชาชนชาวไทยตอนนี้เนี่ยส่วนใหญ่นิยมไปเที่ยวบาหลีอยู่แล้วนะคะก็อาจจะต้องระมัดระวังถ้าจะต้องเดินทางไปก็ต้องตรวจเช็คข่าวสารสนามบินให้เรียบร้อยด้วยนะคะเพราะว่าอัปเดตย้อนสถานการณ์ด้วยนะคะก็คือสถานการณ์ของภูเขาไฟอากุงตั้งอยู่ทางตะวันออกของเกาะบาหลีนะคะก็มีการยกระดับการเตือนภัยนะคะเป็นระดับสีแดงซึ่งเป็นขั้นสูงสุดแล้วก็ขยายรัศมีของพื้นที่อันตรายนะคะจาก 7.5 กิโลเมตรเป็น 8-10 ถึงกิโลเมตรแล้วนะคะประชาชนที่อยู่ในบริเวณนั้นเนี่ยถูกสั่งให้อพยพโดยทันทีนะคะก็มีปัญหาเหมือนกันนะหลายคนก็บอกว่ายังไม่อยากจะออกจากบ้านไปไม่ใช่แค่บริเวณนั้นแต่ว่าคนที่อยู่ตามริมน้ำเนี่ยก็บอกว่าต้องอพยพออกมาด้วยในระยะที่ปลอดภัยเพราะว่าลาวาที่ออกมาเนี่ยอาจจะไหลมากับแม่น้ำก็ได้นะคะนอกจากนี้เนี่ยก็มีการติดตามดูนะคะในด้านของความรุนแรงนะคะซึ่งหลายฝ่ายก็กังวลว่าเอ๊ะมันจะไปเหมือนกับเหตุการณ์ที่เกิดขึ้นเมื่อประมาณ50ปีที่แล้วหรือเปล่านะคะแต่ว่าก็มีการออกมาคาดการณ์ว่าตอนนี้นะตอนนี้เนี่ยยังไม่รุนแรงเหมือนตอนนั้นแต่ถ้าถามว่าตอนนั้นเป็นอย่างไรตอนนั้นมีผู้เสียชีวิตตั้งพันกว่าคนในทีเดียวนะคะ
สำหรับข้อมูลของภูเขาไฟลูกนี้นะคะก็เป็นภูเขาไฟที่ยังเขาเรียกว่ายังมีพลังอยู่นะคะปีเป็นหนึ่งในภูเขาไฟมากกว่า130ลูกในอินโดนีเซียค่ะส่งสัญญาณปะทุเนี่ยหลายเดือนผ่านมาแล้วนะคะตั้งแต่เดือนสิงหาคมที่ผ่านมาเพราะว่ามีแผ่นดินไหวเบาบางและปานกลางหลายระลอกในพื้นที่ก็เลยต้องอพยพประชาชนนับแสนคนนะคะส่วนใหญ่แล้วประชาชนจะอยู่อาศัยบริเวณตินภูเขาไฟด้วยแล้วก็ประเด็นก็คือตอนนี้สนามบินก็ปิดทําการไปตอนแต่วันจันทร์ข่ขาวล่าสุดก็มีปิดมาจนถึงวันพุธนะคะเพราะฉะนั้นใครจะเดินทางก็ต้องเช็คให้ดีๆค่ะค่ะ that's right so moving on to some similar news updates in relation to the Mount Agung eruption and volcanic activity of course as you have mentioned that the Bali International Airport has been closed down due to the volcanic activity now in terms of the Bali airport itself it decided to extend the closure of the airport um, until further notice of course until the situation has become more relieved but however if we take a look at outside the radius that they are calling the warning zone so the evacuation radius is around 8 to 10 kilometers around Mount Agung itself. But there's a village on the outside called Ahmed Village, which is lying just outside of the 8 to 10 kilometer or 5 to 6 miles radius of the volcanic activity or evacuation zones, where there they said that villagers are, of course, still able to continue their daily lives as normal, with residents settling up traditional markets and offering prayers, even as the volcano continued to spew tall columns of ash in the background. Now, the head of the mitigation at the Volcanology and Geological Disaster Mitigation Center, or PVMBG, has said that the agency will continue to monitor Mount Agung for further 24 hours for signs of increased volcanic activity. And in terms of authorities, they have warned that a major eruption is imminent and had ordered 100,000 residents living near the volcano to leave the area. Now, Mount Agung last eruption was in 1963. It killed more than 1,000 people and raised several villages while hurling out scores of hot ash and lava. Hopefully this year, of course, um, or this time, it's not going to be as severe. But however, due to data that the mitigation center has come up with, it shouldn't be that bad. So that's at least some good news. นะคะก็ถ้าไม่รุนแรงเหมือนเหตุการณ์ที่เกิดขึ้นตอนนั้นก็น่าจะยังดีกว่านะคะเพราะว่าตอนนี้ก็ยังไม่ได้มีรายงานว่ามีผู้ที่ได้รับบาดเจ็บหรือเสียชีวิตจากเหตุการณ์ที่เกิดขึ้นแต่อย่างไรก็ตามนะคะถึงแม้ว่าจะมีความกังวลอย่างสนามบินก็บอกไปแล้วนะคะว่ามีการปิดไปจนกว่าสถานการณ์จะกลับเข้าสู่ความปลอดภัยอย่างจริงนะคะแล้วก็สนามบินก็จะมีการประเมินสถานการณ์โดยตลอดด้วยทุกๆ6ชั่วโมงนะคะอย่างไรก็ตามเนี่ยบางหมู่บ้านนะคะก็อาจจะอยู่เลยขอบขอบนะคะพื้นที่ปลอดภัยมานิดนึงยกตัวอย่างอย่างเช่นหมู่บ้านอาเมดเนี่ยเขาบอกว่าประชาชนก็ยังไม่ได้อพยพย้ายไปไหนนะคะก็ยังเดินหน้าใช้ชีวิตปกตินะคะไปตลาดมีจัดตลาดนัดนะคะก็อาจจะมีการออกมาสวดภาวนาบ้างนะคะแต่ว่าภูเขาไฟเนี่ยก็ยังมีการพุ่งปะทุกเท่าถาดออกมาอยู่ตลอดนะคะอย่างไรก็ตามนะคะทางด้านของหน่วยเฝ้าระวังนะคะบรรเทาสาธารณภัยต่างๆนะคะก็โดยเฉพาะสำนักงานบริหารจัดการภัยพิบัติแห่งชาติของอินโดนีเซียก็บอกว่าจะมีการติดตามสถานการณ์ตลอด24ชั่วโมงนะคะถ้าเกิดว่ามีสัญญาณอะไรก็ตามที่น่าจะทำให้เป็นอันตรายเนี่ยก็จะรีบประกาศแจ้งโดยทันทีนะคะส่วนทางด้านของเป็นข้อมูลเพิ่มเติมนะคะสำหรับสายการบินที่ได้รับผลกระทบก็มีทัคแควนตัสเจสตาร์เวจินออสเตรเลียเอเชียการูด้าอินโดนีเซียนะคะก็พยายามที่จะประชาสัมพันธ์ข้อมูลให้กับนักท่องเที่ยวด้วยเพราะว่าตอนนี้ถ้าไปดูข่าวเนี่ยจริงก็มีนักท่องเที่ยวติดอยู่วางแผนอาจจะไปเที่ยวสัก3วัน2คืนตอนนี้อาจจะได้อยู่กันเป็นอาทิตย์กลับบ้านไม่ได้นะคะก็ถือว่าใครเดินทางในจริงๆเขามีคําเตือนมาสักระยะหนึ่งแล้วนะคะก็อาจจะต้องติดตามเพราะฉะนั้นช่วงปีใหม่ใครจะไปอันนี้แนะนําว่าอาจจะเลื่อนไปก่อนหรือเปล่าเฉพาะบาลีนะคะแต่ว่าบาลีในส่วนของอินโดนีเซียที่อื่นก็ยังมีสถานที่ท่องเที่ยวอีกมากมายก็สามารถติดตามข่าวสารดูได้เนาะว่าเราควรจะไปบาลีในช่วงนี้หรือเปล่าหรือว่าควรจะเว้นไปก่อนนะคะโอเค so moving on to some other news updates now on to some news about Myanmar and in terms of Pope Francis who made a visit to Myanmar mm-hmm. and in order to of course visit the minority groups especially the Rohingya in terms of the crisis going on in Myanmar in Rakhine State now Pope Francis has greeted journalists on board a plane in which on Sunday November 26 he traveled to Myanmar um, 
um, for a delicate trip to the majority Buddhist country, accused by Washington, of course. So the United States is accusing Myanmar of ethnic cleansing of the Mohim, Mohim, Muslim Rohingya people, excuse me. So after that, of course, Pope Francis decided to visit the affected area, and he left Rome, and the Pope thanked journalists for their work and said that he hoped that the trip will be, of course, very fruitful. Um, ethnic minorities in traditional dress welcomed Francis at Yangon Airport on Monday, November 27th, and children, of course, presented him with flowers. As we can see here, it's a very nice, warm atmosphere on the airplane mm -hmm. as he's being welcomed. Um, he waved through an open window at dozens of children who were holding Vatican and Myanmar flags and t-shirts with the motto of the trip, love and peace. So that was the motto of his trip. He wants to promote love and peace, especially in Myanmar, which is experiencing a lot of conflict in terms of love and peace and minority groups and religion. So the Pope will also be visiting other countries as well. He will be going to Bangladesh, um, still in relation to the Rohingya crisis, because in Bangladesh there are more than 620,000 Rohingyas that have fled to escape what Amnesty International has dubbed crimes against humanity. The Myanmar army has denied the accusations of murder, rape, torture, and forcible displacements of Rohingyas, however. So hopefully with um, Pope Francis going over there as, of course, the Pope and an ambassador of love and peace, hopefully the situation will be able to get better in Myanmar in terms of Rohingya. ใช่ค่ะเพราะว่าถ้าดูจากข่าวที่ออกมานะคะก็มีข่าวที่ค่อนข้างรุนแรงนะคะจากทหารเบียนมาที่มีทั้งเรื่องของการกระทําโดยใช้ความรุนแรงการข่มขืนการทารุณนะคะซึ่งทําให้นานาชาติเลยออกมาประนามการกระทํานี้แล้วก็การที่โปรฟราซิสเดินทางไปที่เบียนมาเนี่ยเขาก็คาดหวังนะคะว่าอาจจะทําให้สถานการณ์ในเรื่องนี้ดีขึ้นด้วยหรือเปล่านะคะแต่ว่าประเด็นที่โปรจะไปพูดเรื่องขอโรฮิยานะเนี่ยก็มีการออกมาเตือนเหมือนกันว่าระวังว่าจะกลายเป็นศาสนาคริสต์เข้ามายุ่งด้วยอีกประเด็นหนึ่งนะคะแต่อย่างไรก็ตามอันนี้เป็นภาพบรรยากาศของการเดินทางมานะคะก็ได้รับการต้อนรับอย่างอบอุ่นนะคะแล้วก็ทางด้านของสมเด็จพระสันตะปาปาฟรานซิสนะคะซึ่งสเสด็จพระราชดำเนินโดยเที่ยวบินพิเศษของสายการบินอาลิตาเลียนะคะที่เดินทางถึงกรุงย่างกุ้งไปแล้วเนี่ยก็คาดว่าในภาพรวมทริปนี้ก็น่าจะเป็นทริปที่ดีนะคะโดยสมเด็จพระสันตะปาปาเนี่ยจะอยู่ในเบียนมาถึง4วันนะคะมีกำหนดพบกับเจ้าหน้าที่ระดับสูงของรัฐบาลพลเรือและกองทัพไม่ว่าจะเป็นประธานาธิบดีถิ่นจอนางองซาซูจีและพลเอกมินออกลายผู้บัญชาการฐานสูงสุดนะคะซึ่งการพบปะหารือเนี่ยหลายฝ่ายก็คาดหวังว่าน่าจะมีเรื่องของสถานการณ์สิทธิมนุษยชนของชาวโรฮิงญาแล้วก็ปัญหาด้านความมั่นคงและการพัฒนาในรัฐยาไข่ด้วยส่วนในด้านของเมียนมาเองนะคะก็เป็นประเทศที่น่าสนใจคือมีชาวคริสต์ด้วยเหมือนกันแม้ว่าสัดส่วนจะไม่มากนะคะแต่ว่าก็ท่านก็มีกำหนดที่จะมีการพูดในเกี่ยวกับพูดกับชาวคริสต์อีกด้วยนะคะส่วนภารกิจในเมียนมาหลังจาก4วันเสร็จปุ๊บนะคะสมเด็จพระสันตะปาปาก็จะเสด็จไปเยือนบางคลาเทศค่ะโดยบางคาเทศเป็นประเทศที่เกี่ยวข้องกับสถานการณ์ของชาวโรฮิงญาโดยตรงและมากที่สุดเพราะว่ามีชาวโรฮิงญาอพยพไปมากกว่า 600,000 คนนะคะหลั่งไหลไปในรอบระยะเวลากว่า3เดือนที่ผ่านมาเพื่อหลบหนีการสู้รบระหว่างกองทัพเมียนมากับกลุ่มติดอาวุธในรัฐยักษ์ไข่นะคะซึ่งตอนนี้สถานการณ์สู้รบอาจจะไม่มีแต่ว่าผู้ลี้ภัยเนี่ยก็ยังไม่มีคือเดินทางไปบางคาเทศก็กลับมาเมียนมาไม่ได้ะนะคะล่าสุดก็พยายามที่จะมีการเข้ามาไกล่เกลี่ยเช่นมีสหประชาชาติเข้ามาเริ่มเจรจาแล้วก็คาดการว่าจะมีการกระบวนการส่งกลับชาวโรฮิงญาในอีก2เดือนข้างหน้าค่ะ So speaking of the UN coming in to mitigate the situation, of course, yes. in relations to the Rohingya crisis and UN, of course, Bangladesh has said that it has agreed with Myanmar for the UNHCR to assist Rohingya's returns. So Bangladesh and Myanmar have agreed to take assistance from the UN Refugee Agency for the repatriation of hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims. Um, this is what the Bangladesh Foreign Minister Abdul Hassan Mahmoud Al 
Ali has said on November 25th. Now, the two governments have signed a pact on November 23rd, settling the terms for the repatriation process and the return of Rohingya Muslims to Myanmar is expected to start within two months. So we can see that there are some step forwards in terms of what's going on in the relationship between Myanmar and Bangladesh and the UN in terms of trying to mitigate the situation of Rohingyas. And however, uncertainty over whether the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees or UNHCR will have a role had prompt rights group to insist that outside monitors were needed to safeguard the Rohingya's return. Now, a joint working group of the three parties, which is Bangladesh, Myanmar and the UN, will be formed within three weeks and the group will fix the final terms to start the repatriation process. After repatriation, Rohingya Muslims will be kept at makeshift camps near to their abandoned homes. Under the deal, Myanmar will take measures to see that the returns will not be settled in temporary places for long times and Myanmar will issue them an identification card for national verification immediately on their return. So it was a situation before that Rohingya Muslims were not able to go to Bangladesh because they were not accepted. However, they were not able to return home as well. So they were, we can say, stuck in between now. But however, the UNHCR has come in to assist and all three parties are going to help in terms of mitigating the situation, hopefully in the next two months, as they said that they will begin the process of transferring Rohingyas back over. Hopefully that will be a smooth transfer and hopefully things will become better then. ใช่ค่ะก็เป็นสถานการณ์ที่ทั่วโลกจับตาเลยนะคะว่ากระบวนการส่งกลับคืนชาวโรฮิงญานะคะสู่เมียนมาซึ่งก็เป็นบ้านเกิดเมืองนองของเขาแหละนะคะพูดว่าอย่างนั้นจะราบรื่นนะคะโดยทางด้านของกระทรวงการต่างประเทศของบางประเทศนะคะท่านรัฐมนตรีคุณอาบูฮัสซันเนี่ยก็บอกว่าตอนนี้เนี่ยมีการบรรลุนะคะฉันทามติกับเมียนมาในการให้สำนักงานค่าหลวงใหญ่ผู้ลี้ภัยแห่งสหประชาชาติหรือ UNSCR นะคะเข้ามามีส่วนร่วมในกระบวนการส่งกลับผู้ลี้ภัยชาวโรฮิงญาจากบางคลาเทศสู่เมียนมาค่ะก็หลังจากที่ถูก UNSCR วิจารณ์ข้อตกลงที่บางคลาเทศและเมียนมาลงนามร่วมกันนะคะบอกว่าคือเหมือนกับตกลงในหลักการแต่ว่ายังไม่เป็นรูปธรรมและที่สําคัญเลยเป็นประเด็นที่ทุกฝ่ายกังวลก็คือการรับประกันความปลอดภัยแล้วก็สิทธิมนุษยชนขั้นพื้นฐานให้กับผู้ลี้ภัยชาวโรฮิงญาได้อย่างชัดเจนนะคะเขาบอกทางด้านรัฐมนตรีต่างประเทศของบางประเทศท่านบอกว่าผู้ลี้ภัยชาวโรฮิงญาที่ผ่านเกณฑ์ในการเดินทางกลับเมียนมาเนี่ยก็ต้องอาศัยอยู่ในศูนย์พักพิงที่รัฐบาลเมียนมาจะแยกออกมาต่างหากเป็นการชั่วคราวอีกระยะหนึ่งก่อนเดินทางกลับภูมิลำเนาก็คือรัฐยะไข่ซึ่งผู้ลี้ภัยก็จะได้รับสิทธิและเสรีภาพขั้นพื้นฐานตามกฎหมายของเมียนมาโดยกระบวนการจะเริ่มในอีก2เดือนข้างหน้านี้นะคะส่วนทางด้านของเมียนมาเองนะคะรัฐมนตรีด้านสวัสดิการสังคมออกมาบอกว่าจะมีการหารือกับ UNSCR เกี่ยวกับความช่วยเหลือทางเทคนิคของอีกฝ่ายอีกครั้งหนึ่งนะคะแต่ว่าก็ยังไม่มีความชื่อคืบหน้าด้วยก็คือตอนนี้มี3ฝ่ายเข้ามาร่วมกันนะคะแต่ว่าไม่แน่ใจเหมือนกันนะคะว่าอาจจะมีการดึงจีนและอินเดียซึ่งเสนอมอบความช่วยเหลือในด้านการสร้างที่อยู่อาศัยด้วยหรือเปล่าแต่ประเด็นทั้งหมดนี้เนี่ยในหลักการมีแล้วเพียงแต่ว่ายังไม่ได้เริ่มลงมือทําอะไรที่ยังไม่ได้เริ่มลงมือทำเนี่ยหลายฝ่ายก็กังวลโดยเฉพาะพอส่งตัวผู้ลี้ภัยไปอยู่ในสุดพักพิงชั่วคราวก็ไม่ดูว่าจะมีความเป็นอยู่อย่างไรบ้างนั่นเอง That's right. So several countries are trying to come in to help with the situation and to make it better. So hopefully that will be able to move forward. As you said, it mm -hmm. needs to be done in order to start counting and saying that things will actually become better. However, we will keep you posted on the situation. If more news updates come, we will of course let you know about it. But as for now, we're going to take another short break. And when we come back, we have some calendar updates for you. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the program and on to ASEAN calendar. Several events going on in this December for you, so check it out. The 2nd of December 2017, Lao National Day. 
Every December 2nd in Laos is the country's national day. It is celebrated as a public holiday which commemorates the creation of the Lao People's Democratic Republic in the year of 1975. The holiday provides citizens with the opportunity to celebrate their country's history and their present independence through festivities and a day of rest. The Recent History of Laos Laos is commonly called Mueang Lao. It is a country that is landlocked by Myanmar and China to its northwest, Vietnam to its east, Cambodia to its south, and Thailand to its west. The modern country of Laos is closely connected to the Kingdom of Lan Sang Hom Khao, also known as the Kingdom of Million Elephants under the White Parasol. For about four centuries, this kingdom was one of the largest in Southeast Asia. The kingdom was also a hub for trading as it had a central location in Southeast Asia. This trade helped develop the culture to the region now referred to as Laos. Laos and many neighboring countries saw significant political change during the 20th century. Although the Kingdom of Laos was, during the First Indochina War in 1947, officially proclaimed, the country made steps forward full independence in 1953 as a constitutional monarchy. This decision led to a civil war between the Communist Political Party movement of Patet Lao, or the Lao people, and the Royal Lao government. The Laotian Civil War lasted more than two decades and included North and South Vietnam, Thailand, and the United States. Although the Paris Peace Accords of 1973 attempted to stop the fighting, the ceasefire was broken in 1975 by the Patet Lao. On December 2nd of that year, the King Savang Watana was forcibly abdicated, allowing for the Lao People's Democratic Republic to be proclaimed. The National Day celebrates this proclamation. With the creation of a republic, Prince Supa Nuong Tao was also sworn into presidency. Celebrating Lao National Day in Laos The National Day in Laos is celebrated extensively across the country. There are numerous parades, some ceremonies, and even formal speeches. These festivities often include the use of red flags bearing a hammer and a sickle. A new flag has also been introduced to the country which includes the colors blue, white, and red. The red is meant to symbolize blood that has been shed for the country's independence. Blue symbolizes the country's health, also known as Mekong, and the white disc-shaped emblem on the country's modern flag represents the moon over the Mekong, the country's unity, under the communist government. You will likely see a number of these flags if you plan to visit Laos during this time. Some of the biggest cities with the celebrations for the National Day include Vientiane, the largest city in Laos and its capital. This city is located on the Mekong River. Pasque, this is the second largest city in Laos, located in the southern province of Champasak. Sovanake, also known as Khe Son Pomwihan and previously known as Katabuli, is the city with the third largest in Laos and is the capital of the Sawanakate province. Laos is a beautiful country with many large cities and rivers. This Asian country comes with a rich history and a recent secure on a reformed government. Wherever you plan to go on December 2nd while in Laos, you can expect to find some enthusiastic celebration of this part of history that has occurred during the lives of so many citizens. Find yourself a parade and be sure to partake in the celebrations. The 3rd of December 2017, Disability Day. Disability Day or the International Day of People with Disability is a day that has been promoted by the United Nations since 1992. The aim of Disability Day is to encourage a better understanding of people affected by a disability, together with helping to make people more aware of the rights, dignity and welfare of disabled people, as well as raise awareness about the benefits of integrating disabled persons into every aspect of life from economic to political to social and cultural. Disability Day is not concerned exclusively with either mental or physical disability, but rather encompasses all known disabilities from autism to Down syndrome to multiple sclerosis. The History of Disability Day Everything started in 1976 
when the United Nations General Assembly made the decision that 1981 should be the International Year of Disabled Persons. The five years between the making of that decision and the actual Year of Disabled Persons were spent contemplating the hardships of the disabled, how the opportunities of the disabled could be equalized, and how to ensure the disabled take part fully in community life enjoying all of the rights and benefits non-disabled citizens have. Another issue that was touched on was how world governments could go about preventing disabilities from touching people in the first place. So much of the talk was about the viruses and other illnesses that led to various kinds of disability. The decade between 1983 and 1992 was later proclaimed the United Nations Decade of Disabled Persons. And during that time, all of the concepts previously created became parts of one long process that was implemented in order to improve the lives of disabled persons in the world. How to Celebrate Disability Day Each year since 1992, a variety of events are held in many countries. Disability Day is used for holding discussions, forums and campaigns relating to disability and communities are encouraged to organize meetings, talks, and even performances in their local areas. This can range from hosting a musical to a play, with disabled people being involved in these productions. The overall aim is to show non-disabled people that a person with disability can be a vibrant member of society, as it happens that the entirely healthy are not always quite aware of this fact, which can lead to different kinds of discrimination of varying degrees of severity. The disabled, on the other hand, benefit from such performances by providing to themselves that there are many things they can still do, despite their conditions, which can help with their self-esteem and avoid mental issues such as depression from plaguing them. In general, these kinds of events are meant to challenge them and get rid of various stereotypes so that disabled people can enjoy lives free of discrimination and additional hardship. Each year the day is celebrated, there is an emphasis on a new aspect related to improving the lives of people living with disability. In 2007, for example, the theme of the year was Decent Work for Persons with Disabilities. In 2013, it was Break Barriers, Open Doors, for an Inclusive Society and Development for All. A call to help disabled people live in an inclusive society in every country and to make sure that society was as accessible as possible for disabled people in all aspects, from making sure buildings are wheelchair accessible to installing braille on elevator buttons. The 4th of December 2017, Thai Environment Day. Thai Environment Day is celebrated on December 4th, it is an official observance that was established in 1991. Although it is not a national holiday, it is widely marked with various events and activities. On December 4, 1989, the late King Pumipun Adunyade held a birthday ceremony at the Grand Palace. During the ceremony, he delivered a speech on the problems of the Thai environment. Main environmental issues in Thailand include air pollution, deforestation, overfishing, Field and forest burning, lack of water resources, water pollution, poaching, and wildlife habitat loss. The late king expressed concern about the future of the country's environment and called on Thai citizens to cooperate in order to solve environmental issues. Two years later, the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Environment designated December 4th as Thai Environment Day. Since 2002, the celebration has been coordinated by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment that was created that year. Thai Environment Day focuses on raising awareness of environmental issues. On December 4th, Thai citizens are encouraged to engage in eco-friendly activities. For example, plant a tree or ride a bike instead of using public transportation. The 5th of December 2017 the late King of Thailand's birthday and Father's Day. The late King Pumipon Adunyade was born on December 5th, and this day is now celebrated as Father's Day across Thailand. Thai people may give a dog Putaraksa, also known as a kana flower, to their fathers and grandfathers on this day. Many people also wear yellow, which is the late king's color. This day is also celebrated as National Day. 
The reverence in which the people of Thailand hold their king cannot be overestimated. Many Thai people will travel to Hua Hin to celebrate the late king's birthday. Countless more will gather throughout the country to give alms to monks in the morning. Note that the Emerald Buddha Temple will be opened on December 5th to the 6th, but the Royal Palace will be closed both days, and the Royal Chapel will be closed on the 5th, but open on the 6th. The King of Thailand In many Western countries, the concept of constitutional monarchy is well understood. The monarch is seen as a symbol of the nation and its continuity, and for this reason, he or she is expected to be above politics and so a representative of all the people in the state. In Western countries, it is understood that this non-political stance does not necessarily make the monarch immune from criticism or even satire. Thailand is a constitutional monarchy as well, but the concept of kingship in Thailand is much stronger and more far-reaching. The Late King Pumipon Adunya Day Pumipon Adunya Day was born on December 5, 1928 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where his father was studying public health at Harvard. He returned to Bangkok briefly, but in 1933, his mother took him and his brother to Switzerland, where they stayed until the end of the Second World War. Pumipon ascended the throne following the death of his brother on June 9, 1946. This made the late King Pumipon the world's longest reigning monarch. He returned to Switzerland to complete his studies, leaving an uncle to act as regent in his absence. It was in Switzerland that he met and married his wife, Queen Surikit. Following this, he returned to Thailand where the official coronation ceremony took place on May 5, 1950. He is thus the world's longest serving head of state. This date is celebrated every year in Thailand as Coronation Day, a public holiday. The late King Pumipon Adunya Day passed away on October 13, 2016. Or the calendar events to mark your calendars with during this period. With this, we're going to take another short break. We'll be back for the ASEAN interview coming soon. Welcome back to the program. You're watching ASEAN Challenge and on to the ASEAN interview. Continuing on with the situation in terms of the Rohingya Muslim crisis going on between Myanmar and Bangladesh. As we know that several countries are trying to get together in order to mitigate the situation and assist where they can. Now in terms of some of the students and some projects going on around in Thailand as well in order to support the situation, we have a special scoop for you which will go and see what they're doing in terms of Rohingya refugee crisis crisis and in terms of projects to support the camps around Bangladesh. So let's check it out. Hello and Sadika, welcome back to Azin's channel show with your host Pama again. And today we have Jonas, a German student studying here in Rangsit University, who recently did a very nice campaign on fundraising for Rohingya cause. And he's traveling all the way to Bangladesh to meet the people of Rohingya and to, uh, and to provide his help. So let's welcome Jonas. Welcome to the show, Jonas, and thank you for coming to, to share your insights. How are you today? Sadika, sorry. Um, I'm pretty good. I'm just a little bit excited because it's uh, I actually never participated in this kind of professional surrounding in television. So um, 
But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, it's, it's all our pleasure to have you here. So now, could you please tell us about the fundraising event that you organized here in Rangsit University, specially aimed at Rohanian cause? Yeah, sure. Well, it's not actually only a fundraising event. It's mm -hmm. on. It's also. Um, it's also about producing a documentation movie. So we have two two goals. At uh, the one side, we wanted to collect donations here mm -hmm. at Rangsit University also at our home country and from other people, but mainly the donations come from Rangsit University. Um, yeah. Wow, that's pretty interesting to hear about it. So speaking of these uh, initiations and initiatives, what actually motivated you all to go for this? Um, that's a funny story though. Um, we've been in the minivan to Future Park and uh, so me and a friend of mine with her, I'm actually doing this project. It's just mm -hmm. she's she cannot come today, so it's not only my project. Mm -hmm. um, so we were in this mini one, and uh, I read this article in the newspaper on my phone about the Rohingya crisis. I knew about it before, not too much, mm -hmm. but suddenly it was like a click in my head, and came to my mind that we have sounds a bit a little bit like weird, but like we had such a big privilege of studying here at Rangsit University. Like This is a big private uh, university. We have our own apartment, we have our own food, and if I'm hungry at the night, I can just go out and buy more food. I have water as much as I want. And then it came to my mind how close actually this crisis is. So uh, every time I was back in Germany and I heard from crisis going on somewhere in the world, I was sad, of course, mm -hmm. but like it was so far away. But now I realize it's only like I could get into a plane, I've, I could be there in one and a half hours. So it was so strong, this feeling of there's something not right, that we here can live this perfect life mm -hmm. and they are suffering from starvation and so many things which should be just normal for everyone in this world. So very, very heart touching insight from you and good to hear about it. So speaking about the Speaking about this uh, initiative from your side, how supportive were the people, especially uh, relating to the fundraising here in the very Rangsit University, how supportive were the people and uh, what were the general reaction of the people? Yeah, so um, at the beginning, like the first thing we did when we decided to launch this project uh, was going to Ajahn Prinda, which is, uh, she is like mm -hmm. one of the... Um, one of the bosses of the uh, international office. So uh, we told her about our idea and asked her if Rangsit University would or could possibly support our project. And she was very, very supportive from the beginning on. So I would even say Prinda made this project possible because she kind of motivated us to do it. If she would have said, no, sorry, we don't do it here, we probably would have stopped it before it even started. So, but she said, yeah, of course, you can use all our facilities, you can support, uh, we, we support you. You can also say this is an official project of Rangsit University, which is pretty expensive, uh, and important. Um, so, because we have a different approach to other people. If we say we are only two people, mm -hmm. two young people who are doing this, many people will say, so what? But if we say we are like an official project of Rangsit University, so this, is, this was really important at the beginning. And from then on, it was divided in two parts. There were many people here at the university who really supported us a lot. Mm -hmm. They said, it's beautiful what we're doing, it's amazing, and we should go on. And they also donated a lot of money. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there were also many people who did not. Um, because, I'm not sure, should I tell that now? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, because they said, at the first thing, they were a little bit offended or I think they felt offended because we as four angels uh, participated in a political discussion about Southeast Asia and many people at the beginning didn't believe us we really informed ourselves so some people told us we are spreading wrong news mm -hmm. we are spreading like wrong things so we are not we're not talking we're not talking the truth and it became political right away, even if we didn't want it to become political. political. I see, but still then, uh, how successful was the event? Um, well, it was no, not really one event. Mm -hmm. So we had like, we just had this information stand in, uh, in the first floor of the international building. And so we were just collecting donation every day. And then we had one movie night where we just invited everyone to come there. And we were really, really amazed by how many people came because actually like we thought okay there are maybe five six people showing up 
because also the planning, we have never done something like this, so the planning was a disaster. Like we had no idea how to do it. Um, but there were so many people showing up that we even had to get more seats and stuff. So I was, it was really, really cool. And it meant a lot to me because if nobody would participate in our project, we can, we can skip it right away. So that I was really happy at this evening. I see. And uh, also, uh, you are traveling all the way to Bangladesh to meet the people of Rohingya. So how do you intend to meet them? And um, uh, how, how many people are you intending to meet? So we are two. No, you mean how many people I'm intending to meet? meet yes. As many as possible. So um, we are going there the day after tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, we could connect to a project from Bangladesh, which mm -hmm. is called Project Kombal. Mm -hmm. um, it's a funny story, actually, how we got to know them because we were in Kanchanaburi and uh, we were drinking with some friends at this mm -hmm. bridge in Kanchanaburi and there were some people from Bangladesh joining us. And over them, we actually got to know this project, which is now our most important uh, connection to Bangladesh. I think without them, it wouldn't be possible to go there because they told us about everything we need to know. They assured us that we can actually go into the camps and visit the people because that was, that was a big thing. because. Some people told us it's not even possible to go into the camps without a special visa and a permission of the military, which we have now. Mm -hmm. So they really helped us. And uh, when we arrived there, we just like, it's a massive camp, it's a huge camp. So um, we just walk around, do our best to help, help with the project of, uh, of Combal. So they're building sanitary buildings and mm -hmm. solar, solar powered street lights. Mm -hmm. We just donate a part of the money we collected to this project and we also help them like with our own hands to build it up and during that we just walk around and talk to as many people as possible. Okay, very impressive to hear the whole story from very uh, initiator who organized the whole thing. So now speaking of more, what are your aims and plans, further aims and plans? You mean in my life? Yes, <laughs> yes, in your life and also for this whole thing. Yeah. So um, let's start on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I would like, of course, my, my dream is to, my dream sounds a little bit stupid, but uh, my goal is to, to raise awareness of this topic because I had the impression that like in Western media, this topic is discussed definitely, but when it came to my friends back home, when I was telling them about this topic, most of them just said Rohingya, who is that? What is that? What is going on there, actually? So I had the feeling that this crisis got so big that th it can't be solved on a national basis. So there need to be international awareness. And of course, we are a small project. We are not really professional filmmakers, and we have no experience with humanitarian aid. But mm -hmm. I still have the hope that if we spread this documentation movie I told you before, um, if we spread it in our home country, then people will maybe see, hey, um, it's actually not too big because I always had the feeling before this is the first project I really decided to do but before that I always had the feeling it's it's too big the world is too big for me I can't do something maybe I can donate to the United Nations mm -hmm. but it's every everything is so big I just felt like too small too lonely too too helpless mm -hmm. so I thought if people see that just two normal students without any background in humanitarian help or filmmaking well, a little bit but um, if they can do a project like this, maybe people start to think and say, well, it's, pr it's actually not that hard. Maybe, maybe I can do something too. And maybe they feel like we don't want to produce this kind of voyeuristic, sad movie we, had, we have seen like 100 times before. We want to create a hopeful movie, which shows the people that there is hope in the world, that we can do something, and also how we did it and how it can be done. So yeah, that's that's the goal for this project. And for my life, I would actually, I could really think of continuing this project on other crises in the world. And in general, I want to become a filmmaker or a photographer for international um, topics in humanitarian aid. Very inspiring. So uh, how Thank do you. you feel about the world? Do you feel the world is headed more towards uh, disasters? humanitarian yes. or <laughs> how do you feel about the world um yeah i definitely feel like that so um my teacher in international organizations actually said something which i found pretty uh, impressive or like which really um 
moved me because I was asking him exactly the same question. I was asking him why, why would you say is the world turning that weird? Because obviously it is. Like look at America, look at Turkey, look at there's so many places in the world which are like right now totally crazy. And when I was born and raised, the world was more or less okay. So I asked him that, and he was just like smiling a little bit at me and said, "So you had actually the luck." that you were born in a time where we were raised in peace, security, and yeah, so, uh, but don't take that for granted, because it's not. So it's, this is actually like the world is turning, and it will always happen again that the world is getting like it is right now. So I just hope there are enough people who are aware of that they, that they have to help each other, because our way, it, our world, like the globalization is getting more and more over the world. So we are still thinking in national topics. Mm -hmm. So Thailand is thinking on their behalves, like on, on their on their own topics. Mm -hmm. Germany is thinking about Germany. So but the problems which we have in the world, they are global. Climate change, mm -hmm. refugee crisis. So we need to th start thinking global. Mm -hmm. Very thoughtful of that. And uh, how do you think, uh, especially when it comes to such uh, sensitive issues of minorities, how do you think people as individual and also like globally should uh, work on it? Mm, I think that's a different, uh, difficult question. So mm -hmm. in general, humanitarian aid is a difficult question because uh, on a long-term view, humanitarian aid is probably not good because there are many people who are saying, and I belong to them, that uh, if there should really be a change in the like how how some countries change their politics, we need to more or less leave them alone with their problems because there's no other way that they can develop a way to to get out of them. On the other on the other hand, um, it's like of course impossible to just look away where they're like this is a place where actually people are dying right now, they're starving right now, children have no food. So how can a human being look away and say, okay, we do nothing, but on the long-term purpose, it will be good. We c just can't do it. I think it's not possible. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, okay. very much. So um, before closing down the whole conversation, uh, we I, n I would like to request you for further comments and suggestions, like what you aspire, your aspirations overall. Um, I would really like to say thank you to everyone who supported us because without all the people who were helping us, who were telling us that we are doing the right thing, that they like what we're doing, we would have stopped the project. So um, without all the people, without Let's start with my parents, let's start with the people here from university, just random people on our donation stand, uh, journalists, many journalists actually, which like people who are pretty big, I would say, like actually, so I've never expected that they would interfere in our project. Those people gave us contacts, gave us information, gave us advice, and I'm so thankful for that. So I really want to say thank you. Okay. Also to you okay. for inviting me and giving me the chance thank, to Thank you so it. much for coming here and wish you all the best for your future endeavors, especially in this journey towards helping humanitarian crisis that's happening around. So good luck and have a safe travels to thank Bangladesh. You much, thank you so much. So um, that was Jonas, an inspiring youth with a compassionate, uh, s with a compassionate heart, sorting to help out the humanitarian crisis that's happening around. So stay tuned in for m s more such stories for the next week. Thank you so much. ก็ถือว่าเป็นกิจกรรมที่ส่งเสริมนะคะการทำความดีให้กับสังคมไม่ใช่แค่ในประเทศไทยแต่ว่าเป็นประเด็นท้าทายของอาเซียนด้วยนะคะในการช่วยเหลือชาวโรฮิงญานะคะก็เป็นกิจกรรมดีๆจากน้องๆน,นะคะนักศึกษาปริญญาโทแล้วก็นักศึกษาแลกเปลี่ยนนะคะจากวิทยาลัยนานาชาติมหาวิทยาลัยดังสิทธิ์ค่ะค่ะ with that said we're going to wrap up the program for this week thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week as for now สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ